So our, our next speaker is Dr. Jordan Weiner, and Dr. Uh, Weiner practices here in Scottsdale. So, uh, good morning again. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk today about obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which is the majority of sleep apnea. And uh, I don't have a slide for my objectives, but there's three things that I want everyone to hopefully come away with today, even if you don't remember some of the statistics that I'm going to present. First of all, sleep apnea is really common. A lot of your patients have it. Secondly, sleep apnea is underdiagnosed. In fact, it's usually not diagnosed. Um, actually, we have four objectives. Uh, third, sleep apnea is very serious. And uh, sleep apnea shortens people's lives. So it's very important that we understand that this may not be cancer, but it is a very, very serious condition. And then lastly, there are a lot of options for the treatment of sleep apnea. There is no one perfect option for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So if you have somebody who has obstructive sleep apnea and they're not being treated or not being treated very well, don't stop there. Keep pursuing other options until you have someone who's being successfully treated. I have no conflicts. First off, we talked about, I talked a minute ago that this is a common condition. Well, this is how common it is. Uh, a lot of studies have looked at, at prevalence. Uh, the best that I've seen was from the University of Wisconsin. They actually followed a large cohort of randomly selected adults living in Wisconsin. These were not clinic patients. And they followed them for uh, about 14 years. The overall prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea uh, was 26%. Uh, but more significantly, the presence of moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea which is defined as an apnea hypopnea index over 15, is about 10%. Uh, it's twice as common in men as it is in women. About 13% of men and about 6% of women have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. And remember, AHI, or apnea hypopnea index, stands for the number of times per hour of sleep that somebody essentially stops breathing. Uh, about 75% of patients who actually have obstructive sleep apnea are not diagnosed. So it's, it's in your practice, and these are people who have serious obstructive sleep apnea. Why does this occur? Well, occur, it occurs because our throat, our pharynx, has two purposes. Uh, we breathe through it, and we eat through it. If you were designing a machine, you would never do this, but this is how our throat works. So when you swallow, the walls of the throat have to contract, and they have to come together to propel the food or liquids into your esophagus, which means they need to be collapsible. Uh, the problem is that that prevents or precludes any fixed structural support for the pharynx akin to what we see with rings of the trachea. So it is collapsible. And during apnea, these walls collapse uh, together, obstructing airflow. We see in patients with sleep apnea a reduced cross-sectional area on CT and MRI. But the reason that this is a problem is that during wakefulness, people don't obstruct their airways. Um, one of the reasons is that the body unconsciously compensates for this reduced area by dilating actively. And one of the most important dilators is a tongue muscle called the genioglossus. This pulls the tongue forward. And so patients with, with obstructive sleep apnea have actually been shown to have increased abnormal tone to the genioglossus muscle during daytime hours. Uh, however, this increased activity of the genioglossus muscle and other dilators disappears when they go to sleep, and that allows the collapse to occur. Symptoms of sleep apnea are common. Of course, snoring. These, these patients are legendary snorers. Uh, sometimes there will be reports of choking at night. Insomnia is actually very common. Nocturia, meaning getting up during the night to urinate. Sometimes there's witness apnea. Uh, uh, psychiatric and neurological symptoms, including memory loss, depression and irritability, and decreased libido. This slide, to me, is one of the most important in the presentation in that it confers the seriousness of this problem. And I refer to the data in this slide all the time when I'm counseling patients about their sleep apnea, particularly uh, my non-motivated patients. Uh, this study uh, the, again, this is the Wisconsin study. 
followed randomly selected people over a very long period of time. Uh, and here we, we're looking at all-cause all mortality in their patients. Uh, you can see, let's see if this works, this top line here, which is very, uh, very light, shows the survival of normal people who don't have obstructive sleep apnea. So over a 14-year period of time, uh, the vast majority are still alive at the end of the study. About 96% are still alive. But what you see is that with progressively increasing severity of sleep apnea, survival is dropping rapidly, particularly for people with a severe obstructive sleep apnea. More than 40% of patients who have severe untreated obstructive sleep apnea have died during the 14 years of the study. And so um, you can see, in fact, for cardiovascular mortality, there's a five times higher mortality rate for cardiovascular mortality in patients with untreated severe obstructive sleep apnea. The average time to death is 12 years. And so that patient who says, ah, oh, I, you know, I, I sleep fine, uh, I feel great in the morning, uh, I tell them, well, uh, chances of you being uh, alive in 12 years is about 60% if you don't treat this. And importantly, again, for that non-motivated patient who's got severe sleep apnea, there is no correlation, this was, this was the, the, uh, the quiz question at the beginning, there is no correlation whatsoever between the severity, uh, I'm sorry, be, between the presence or absence of symptoms of sleepiness and the consequences or outcomes of, of uh, sleep apnea. So a person who says, I feel great, I sleep well, I feel good in the morning, I'm not tired, it doesn't matter, they're just as likely to die from their sleep apnea as someone who doesn't have symptoms. So why does this happen? Uh, I used to think before seeing some of these studies that it was the hypoxia, the reductions in oxygen levels that was responsible for the problems. But actually, it's probably not the major mechanism. It's the sympathetic nervous system uh, and sympathetic nervous system activation which causes a lot of the morbidity and mortality with sleep apnea. With every apneic episode, there's actually a surge in the sympathetic nervous system with release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the circulation. That leads to all the things you would expect from those hormones, including tachycardia, increased cardiac output, increased peripheral vascular resistance, increased renal tubular sodium resorption. All of these will contribute to systemic hypertension. Um, there is an increased risk of stroke, and uh, a Mayo Clinic uh, paper showed that uh, collectively uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea is as strong an independent risk factor for ischemic heart disease as obesity, smoking, and hypertension. Um, so, uh, in addition to ischemic heart disease and stroke, there is a markedly increased risk of arrhythmia in obstructive sleep apnea, particularly the tachyarrhythmias. Uh, patients have hypertension. Uh, oh, going back to the arrhythmia issue, uh, when someone has a new onset of atrial fibrillation, especially a younger person, that should be almost a reflexive uh, um, point where we look for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, there is an effective increased afterload on the heart during apneic episodes because of the lower intrathoracic pressure during apnea, uh, and there's increased platelet aggregation and uh, reduced fibrinolytic uh, activity as well. So uh, prior to 1983, when Sullivan reported on the use of CPAP for obstructive sleep apnea, tracheostomy was literally the only treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, and it was usually only performed in very severe cases. Uh, CPAP uh, basically provides continuous positive airway pressure to the, uh, to the throat, uh, and this, the pressure is determined by uh, the sleep study uh, when the pressure is titrated by the technician to eliminate the patient's sleep apnea. And this prevents the collapse of the walls of the throat. Uh, there are some variations on CPAP. I won't go into too much. Uh, AutoPAP is the most common. Uh, variation where the machine itself has algorithms and software to adjust the pressure setting to effectively eliminate the patient's sleep apnea. For more severe uh, sleep apnea where very high pressures are required, 
uh, two-level uh, CPAP or bi-level bi or BiPAP is often used to make it more tolerable to the patient. Um, unfortunately, many patients either won't or cannot get used to sleeping with CPAP. And I don't have the figures here, but the, the compliance rate with CPAP varies from study to study, but it's in the 40 to 60 percent range. So about half, half of patients prescribe CPAP can or will use CPAP long term. And because of that, uh, although CPAP almost always is effective, it's about 99% effective, if you're not wearing it, it's not working. And so we have to have, we have, to have other ways of treating that patient's uh, sleep apnea other than CPAP. Um, and that's, that's going back to my original point, which is if you have somebody who has moderate to severe sleep apnea, uh, we need to do good follow-up with them. We need to ask them if they're still using their CPAP and uh, how many hours per night they're using their CPAP. The machines now will give you that data if you look at compliance reports. And if you see that they're not using it more than four hours, you know, most of the time, at least 70% of the time, they're not a successful user and we should, we should either figure out how to make them more successful or move on to a different form of treatment. One of those other treatments can be an oral appliance. Oral appliance is uh, usually what's called a mandibular advancement device, which pulls the mandible forward, uh, and in doing so, opens up the back of the throat by pulling the tongue and epiglottis forward. Um, these oral appliances tend to be most effective for mild cases of sleep apnea, um, but they can be used in more severe cases. Um, on average, we're gonna see a reduction in their AHI of uh, 30 to 72 percent, um, depending on what study you're looking at. And again, overall success varies quite a bit depending on the study, um, but it's probably in the 50 percent range. Compliance is also probably about 40 to 50 percent. If the patient is treated with an oral appliance, because unlike a CPAP machine, which gives you compliance re data, an oral appliance doesn't give you anything like that, it's very important that a treatment uh, see a sleep study, which can often be done at home with a home sleep test, be performed after the patient has adjusted to using their oral appliance so that you know that the oral appliance is actually uh, treating their uh, sleep apnea successfully. If it isn't, we need to move on. Uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, or UPPP, was uh, basically described by Fujita in the 1980s. This is the most common surgery that's been performed over the years for obstructive sleep apnea. We remove the uvula and a little part of the uh, soft palate. We reshape the soft palate. There's a couple variations out there. Tonsillectomy is also done at the same time if that's not already been done. Uh, UPPP success rates also vary widely depending on patient selection, but also the duration of the study. Uh, we do see a higher short-term success rate, about two out of three are successful in the short term, but unfortunately this does fall below 50% in long-term studies uh, following surgery. Uh, like oral appliances, UPPP has a higher success rate with thinner patients who have milder sleep apnea. Uh, in my opinion, most patients are not candidates for this procedure who have obstructive sleep apnea. This brings me to uh, the last form of treatment that I'm gonna discuss here today and the one that currently I find uh, the most interesting, which is hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Um, show of hands, how many people here have heard of this before? A couple people. So uh, this was just approved by the FDA in 2014. Think of this as a pacemaker for sleep apnea. It involves basically placing a pacemaker in the right side of the chest, just like a pacemaker, we don't put it on the left for a number of reasons, one of which is we don't want it being confused with a pacemaker. And from that pacemaker, one lead or electrode goes up to the hypoglossal nerve, which stimulates the tongue musculature, and a second wire goes down to a sensor, which is inserted between uh, uh, the internal and external intercostal muscles to detect respiration. So when the patient takes a breath in, the device then sends a signal to the hypoglossal nerve, which tells the tongue to move forward and out of the way. When the tongue moves forward, it also pulls the soft palate forward and the epiglottis. It's only on during sleep. So when the patient goes to bed, they actually turn it on with a small remote control and they turn it off in the morning. 
Schematically, this is what it looks like on the left side. You can see the pacemaker device with the two, uh, the two wires coming off. This is all completely internal, so the patient doesn't uh, see anything. Um, and then on the right side, you can see that uh, the stimulus is only during inhalation, not during exhalation. So during exhalation, the tongue relaxes. Schematically at the top, uh, we have the picture of, of the pharynx. And you can see the very back of the, the pharynx here in the patient with sleep apnea is closed. There's no, uh, there's no opening here. And we can see with, with Inspire stimulation, this space opens right here. Um, hopefully this plays now. On the left side, we're actually going to show down here live video of somebody asleep who's got obstructive sleep apnea. This is the back of the tongue to orient you, and this is the back of the throat. And this is the soft palate in the back of the throat. So let's see if this works. Yes. So you can see that space right there is obstructing. This is completely obstructed. So this patient, this is, this is what sleep apnea actually looks like endoscopically. Now we're going to see what happens when you turn on Inspire during sleep. And you can see the epiglottis moving forward. You can see the vocal cords. You can see the palate moves forward and out of the way. In terms of success, at this point, even though it's only been out for four years, there have already been dozens of published uh, studies uh, looking at long-term outcomes with, uh, with hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Uh, this, is, this is one of the larger uh, studies published. This is over 300 patients from 10 centers around the world. Um, we can see a mean reduction in their apnea hypopnea index uh, from 36 to 10 uh, with an with a, uh, absolute AHI reduction of 25, representing a 71% decrease. Uh, if we look at, at literature evaluating outcomes for sleep apnea, the standard definition is a reduction of 50% in their AHI, with a final AHI below 20 is the standard that's been used for many years. And we see that in about 78 or 80% in the ADHERE registry. Uh, some of the newer uh, studies that have come out actually are showing higher success rates but that is the, the published number. So I tell patients we're talking about an 80% about an success rate for Inspire. Patients are averaging six and a half hours per night, which I didn't show the figure for CPAP. CPAP actually is uh, less. The average patient with CPAP is using it four to five hours a night. So this is superior to that. And these are in patients who failed CPAP. 90% uh, of patients report a better experience than using CPAP and 96% would do it again. There's a very, very low complication rate and typically nothing serious. So current implant criteria for INSPIRE is patients have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea with an AHI between 15 and 65. They can be mildly obese, but not morbidly obese with a BMI less than 35. They must be adults. They have to be either intolerant or non-compliant with CPAP. They must have a recent sleep study, and they can't have more than 25% of their apneas being central sleep apneas. Central sleep apnea is when there is no drive to take a breath, and the patient simply skips a breath. Uh, Inspire will not work for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, they can't have what we call complete concentric collapse of their, of their airway at the level of the soft palate on sleep endoscopy. Um, and what that means is that high in the throat, the side walls can't come together. It has to be predominantly anterior-posterior collapse. So we, to do Inspire, we first take the patient to the operating room and perform sleep endoscopy with, uh, with propofol sedation and make sure that their pattern of collapse is going to be suitable for Inspire before proceeding. And most, most patients do, but about one in five will actually fail that exam and cannot get Inspire. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Someone has this implant, can MRI? Yes. Uh, good question. So the question is, can you get an MRI if you've had Inspire? The answer is, uh, the first generation in Inspire, the answer was no. The current generation, which is generation two, they can have, in, they can have MRI of the brain, 
and extremities and abdomen. They're not supposed to technically have an MRI of the thorax. Um, my understanding is there are some MRIs in the valley that are able to do uh, MRIs even on the chest, but it has to be a discussion with the radiologist. But definitely brain and extremities. If you had a patient that was obese and they had sleep apnea, when they lose weight and get their BMI down to like 25 or whatever, this is sleep apnea. Would they be okay with not using their sleep apnea? Would their sleep apnea go away? So if I'm understanding correctly, the question is, as people lose weight who have obesity and they have obstructive sleep apnea, what happens? Um, their sleep apnea almost always gets better and often dramatically better. So I, I counsel patients that if they lose significant weight, to me that's at least 20 pounds, and it depends on where they're starting at, get a new sleep study at their lower body weight uh, because it does get better. Um, there was a study uh, published many years ago that looked at bariatric surgery, morbid obesity, and obstructive sleep apnea. And in this particular study, that had about a dozen patients in it, all of whom had severe obstructive sleep apnea. Several of them had tracheostomies. That's, that's how bad their sleep apnea was. Um, all of their sleep apnea went away. I mean, resolved with you know, 150 pounds of weight loss. So absolutely, it gets better. So my question is regarding the anxiety Yes. Uh, well, some people uh, with with uh, anxiety and claustrophobia really cannot tolerate CPAP at all, and um, for them, a lot of them will refuse to use CPAP because they can't put anything on their face uh, if they can fall asleep with uh, something like Ambien, you could do that uh, with, with their CPAP um, or, or potentially pursue other, other forms of treatment if they're candidates for them. Do we have more time? Or? Yeah, one more question. Is this a lifetime? Yes. So unlike surgery like the uvular palatal pharyngoplasty, this is a treatment. This is a, a fix. So they, this is lifetime therapy. It's just different from CPAP. Um, the battery in the, in the unit, just like a pacemaker, is going to uh, expire eventually. Projections are about 10 to 12 years. So patients are told that in about 10 to 12 years, we're going to be removing it and putting in uh, a new one. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wayne.